Hi, so this welcome to this evening's exciting adventure, Love Not Fear, with my wonderful co-host, Jack Cox, author of Love Not Fear. And I haven't got the book with me today because <laughs> I'm pet sitting for some wonderful animals. Uh, we've got Rupert here asleep. He might stick his head up later on. I've got Honey Bear down here, the Honey, honey Monster. Oh, um, bless. Uh, he might, she might come and say hello later. And uh, be inquisitive got, about our lovely show. And I've got Simone, the three legged cat in a cat cave over in that oh, corner. Oh, bless. So bless we them. may have, they may be part of the show later on. I think so, you know. So I am uh, the co host of Love Not Fear. I'm Annie Day, author of Orgasmic Health and your guide to feeling fabulous fast. Excellent reads. And I will Thank put the link Jeff. below in the description uh, where you can order your coffees. Yay! So you've got some stuff prepared for us tonight, Annie. I have indeed. Do you want me to start? Yep. Launch into it. Righty, right. So... What you need to get started foraging in the UK. So a good plant identification book, um, make sure you get a dedicated field guide because what we don't want is you to be eating anything that is poisonous or is gonna make you vomit or any other catastrophic events. So you really need to make sure that you know, you know what it is that you're picking before you eat it. Pens and a notepad so you know where you had it from, when you had it from. On that note, quick disclaimer before we get started. This is for information only. We're not responsible if anybody uh, misidentifies a plant and um, gets ill. Okay. Okay. So um, carry on. A pen knife. You'll need a pen knife for cutting some things, but also to whittle things as well. Secateurs. I've lost so many pairs that I've actually got. A pair of secateurs now that are wrapped up with yellow insulating tape so that I can't lose it up the allotment or in my garden mm -hmm. or when I'm foraging, basically. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's going to work for everybody, but you need something. You, most of the um, secateurs have black handles or green handles on, which isn't very good. They become camouflaged when we're out in nature. So I'd suggest putting something on like, I don't know, yellow insulating tape red tape, something like that, so that you can quickly find where you put your secateurs. Um, a pruning saw, a little pruning saw, it doesn't have to be expensive, just a little one, so that you can actually take cuttings, you can take um, some little twigs, you can, for instance, cut things back like sage, put rooting compounds on and then stick them in the ground. Rosemary, rarely needs anything other than to be cut, sliced, and then just popped in the ground, basically. The other thing that I'd recommend that you have when you go out foraging is good, strong gardening gloves and rubber gloves. Um, some of the plants have stinging properties or they have thorns or they have whatever. <coughs> what you don't want is to be injured while you're collecting all your beautiful plant magic that is edible. So another addition to that would be a hand trowel so yeah. that you can dig up any roots. I'm, um, I'm experimenting at the moment with um, dandelion roots. So you do need something like a hand trowel so you can dig out those roots so that you can dry them and then use them later. We must and just say that in the UK, it is illegal to uproot any plant from the wild. You can do it in your garden. Well, that's where private. I've done it, obviously. That's yeah, we, we, we do, we do, but just we, we just stay within the law. We need yeah, to... well, it's trespassing and all the rest of it, but oh yeah. Anyway, um, you need a hand basket or a trug to put your beautiful things in that you've found. And what I usually do with the hand basket or the trug is to line it with either baking parchment or kitchen roll, something like that, because... Some of what we might be collecting has got seeds or pollen in, and we really want to keep that intact. So 
if you line it with paper, either baking parchment or um, kitchen roll, something like that, that's absorbent. Um, linen bags, I rave about linen bags all the time. They are much better than plastic. There are times when only plastic will do, which I'll get onto shortly. But linen bags are better so that when you've collected your beautiful specimens, they're not going to dry out and go mouldy, basically. They're going to be quite intact because linen's a natural material. Um, pocket knife. Pocket knife. Just for cutting things that are a little bit too fibrous for us to... I like to collect things with my hands where possible, but sometimes that just isn't possible if it's, you know, um, if the bush or the herb has got thorns on it or it's stinging nettles. I know that you can safely pick up stinging nettles, but I can't always be bothered to do that, especially when I'm out in nature. I'd want to be very sure that I wasn't going to be stinging myself. Um, a digging tool, a trowel or a mini fork, again, to be able to lift things up. Again, there's so much in our local gardens. I wouldn't recommend that you use, for instance, somebody was telling me they collected dandelions out to the local park. And I said, I'm really sorry, but I wouldn't eat anything because it's we don't know what's being sprayed on them. Whereas in your own garden... Or what's peed on it. Yeah, exactly. We, we don't know that. Whereas in your own garden, then you'll know that really easy, won't you? Um, I'm very blessed that I've got a friend who's got a farm with loads of acres of land. And they don't use any herbicide, pesticide, insecticide. So if I was going to, I'd make sure it was somewhere like that where I know that there's, there's going to be nothing on the plants that I want to be eating. Yeah, that's um, good. You can get a drying rack for herbs. My grandparents used to have a wooden one that went over the range. Sadly, I don't have a range, nor do I have a drying rack, but I've adapted my drying rack for clothes. And all I do is put newspaper down or couch roll on it and then either hang them up. So, you know, tie them up and hang them up to dry or alternatively just lay them down basically in the heat of the air will actually help to dry them out. Um, <coughs> you also need sharp eyes, patience and practice. Like all things, Jack, we know this, don't we? The more practice we have, the better it is. That's right, yeah. So botanical language. I get really turned on by botanical language. <laughs> um, <laughs> is that Rosarina what it is? Rosarina <laughs> <laughs> so talked her to Jimmy in Latin works beautifully. <laughs> oh, we know how to get you going then, do we? All right. <laughs> so as with any language, botany needs to be practiced before it can be understood. Often, initially perhaps confusing, technical languages are vital because they help us to specify about stuff and to prevent confusion. Technical words are typically precise. For example, take the word cecil, which when talking about fruits or leaves means without a stalk. By any other way of describing this, it needs more than one word to explain the meaning so that it makes it more useful. So when we're talking to someone else and saying, right, this is what I did, that it was cecil, it wasn't the stalk of the plant as well. And it inspires other people to be able to do it then because they know what we're talking about, that we're not including the whole of the stalk. So if it's Cecil, it means that it doesn't have the stalk on. To become comfortable using botanical language, start with looking at a plant leaf you already know. Let's go outside and find a daffodil. Not a daffodil, dandelion even. <coughs> My beautiful little Don't dandelion. Don't eat daffodils. <laughs> <laughs> daffodils are poisonous. My brain had gone off somewhere completely different there, clearly. Um, so pick one and take it inside, look at it, closely observe it for a good few seconds on each side, as well as the leaf edges and leaf stalks as well. I've also got blackberry leaves here as well. So, you know, look on the reverse of it as well. You'll see that it's far more veined or, or the veins are far more prominent 
on the reverse of it than they are on the front of it. Um, I have tasted blackberry leaves and they're a bit of an acquired taste. Yes. They're a bit of an acquired taste, but... What do they taste like, like Annie? Um, well, they didn't really taste, I don't know, unpleasant or pleasant, but there was a really nice blackberry aftertaste once you chewed it and swallowed okay. it. Okay. And then I've got peppermint. And again, you know, looking at the underside of the leaves as well as the, the top of it as well. And we're all familiar with peppermint. It's, you can make peppermint tea. You can make a peppermint salve that you can put on your um, tummy if you've got an upset stomach. It's so good for so many things. There are lots of indigenous people that um, chew peppermint as toothpaste to clean their teeth as well. And, you know, a lot of the commercially produced toothpaste that we have in the UK do have peppermint in. So, um, can I make a contribution on this? Yeah. Yep, please do. Purple dead nettle. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, that's purple dead nettle. Beautiful. The real gun. The real gun. Part of the mint family, but it doesn't taste like mint. Yeah. No. And then Beautiful that, though, isn't it? Fantastic. I can't yes. believe it. <laughs> Lovely, isn't it? Yeah. I, I know people who don't Thank like you, the yeah. taste of the leaves, but they put the flowers um, on salads. Yeah, yeah. A bit like nasturtium, isn't it? That they, they can be used in lots of ways that we might not have thought of. So um you can also make a lovely tea out of them. Yeah, indeed. So dandelion's Latin name is Terapscum officinale. Clover is Trifolium pratense. Dock leaves are Rumex species. Nettle is Urtica doitia. Elder is Sambucus niagara. And blackberry is Rubus fruticosus leaf. Okay. I've, I've pronounced those beautifully, I'm sure you've noticed. No, I, I, I can't fault that in any way whatsoever, young lady. It's getting turned on by Latin, you know. Yeah, that's what it is, uh, baby. She's just no idea how good this is. Uh, she's just got to think, just, and you've just got to think about Italians, haven't you, though? <laughs> I don't know about Italians, but yeah. Latin. Latin. <laughs> You may already have some of these nearby or in your own garden. Pick one, take it inside, look at it, closely observe it for a good few seconds on each side, as well as the leaf edges and the leaf stalk. Look at the leaf colour and shape. Is the leaf you hold simple? That means just on a stalk on its own, as shown by the nettle and dandelion. So they usually one head, one dandelion head to one stalk. Yeah. So that's what that means. Um, or are they compound of main, uh, many leaf, leaflets attached to one central stalk as displayed by elder ash or blackberry leaf? So as you can see, there's several on that. Yeah. That's, you know, there's what, one, two, three, four, five. There's five on that particular one. Um, a compound leaf can also be pinnate, being made of leaflets in opposite pairs, such as elder or ash. Simple leaves may be pinnulated lobed, meaning just like a flange of the leaf is always present. Dandelion is a good example of what is otherwise known as an oppositely lobed leaf. Oh, hello. Hello. This is Honey, the Honey Monster. Hi, Honey. Oh wow, wow! Gorgeous. I've got a bunny. I've got, I've got a bunny rabbit. I've got a bunny rabbit. Yes. You see your yes. bunny rabbit. What's the yes. other one? What's Hello. the other one? Woof, woof. It's a, it's a, it's a teddy bear with a pink nose. <laughs> oh. Hang on. Oops. I think I prefer my honey monster. Oh, um, I think so too, darling. So the common clovers have three leaflets. And these are typically described as trifolate plants or trefoil plants. So the tri bit is obviously three. 
Um, the devil is in the detail. Closely observing plants and habitat is critical. When observing, it is absolutely vital to examine all of the leaf and stalk for any hairs and any of the features such as groovings, colorings, angles, and so on. Always check the color of the undersides, noting features such as pronounced veins, prickles, etc. Are the leaf stalks and stems hollow or solid? So this obviously with the dandelion. This is square. This has got square roots. Right. It's not round, it's square. It's square, stem, square stem, not roots. Stem. Oh, yeah. oh. Stem. <laughs> now, the dandelion stem. is a tube, isn't it? Because you can see all the way through it. So, this is the dandelion stem. So, yeah, it's circular, but it's got a hollowed out bit on it. Whereas this is a, a solid stem on it, basically. Um, where do we get to? When you attempt to identify closely related and similar looking plants, the answer to these questions and a few others will be required and their discovery should soon lead you to the correct identification. We naturally come across plants in different habitats from a range of angles and different light levels when looking for wild food. The individual colour, height and spread with resultant shadowing and shading produced by any particular plant species gives an overall textural impression of the plant, both to the eye and to the mind, while set against or still a part of its natural surroundings. An amalgamation of information pours in via our senses from which the brain will create a facsimile for each of the different plant species and hopefully logs that information into our long-term memory. Sounds good to me. Sounds yeah. good to me. When you are regularly going out foraging in the UK and in, are intent on finding the same plant again, the brain begins to identify and sift through the different plant shapes in a way that compares to how we remember people's faces. So once I've seen Chrissy, the next time I see you, if I've looked at your face carefully, I will know that that's Chrissy the next time. And just like that with uh, plants and foliage, if we recognise that, you know, the next time we see it, we will know what that is basically. So by using all of our senses and our intuition, that can really help us to memorise it. Yeah. Um, something similarly undoubtedly happens when we are wild food foraging and spotting plants that otherwise remain hidden within a green wall. So sometimes there's so much vegetation that it's hard to pick out individual ones. Search and research is the forager's way. When coming across new plants, gather as much information about them as possible from their particular environment and habitat. Be still and take in its surroundings. Because our <laughs> sense of smell is going to be working, our hearing's going to be working, and our taste buds as well. And also, if we're picking them with our hands, there's something very sensual about us doing that, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Consciously observe the colour, the shape of the plants from a range of angles, Get to know plants at the same site at different times of the year. As you do, you will begin to appreciate their overall habits and format. Use all available plant resources to fine tune your foraging brain. So it's, it's kind of like memorising the smell, the taste, the texture, everything about that particular plant. Seeing plants evolve through the seasons is crucial. It is only at certain times of the year we can observe specific critical features that help us correctly identify it. Some features like hairs will wither away quickly on plants. This can happen during its growth cycle and obviously when the remains are decaying. 
Other plant features, though, will persist. It is really handy to know all available features. Even in the dead of winter, if you know what the skeletal remains of certain flowering stalks or leaves are, then you can find the new growth in the early part of the year, often from quite a distance away. Yeah. So just noticing the, I don't know, the silhouette, the shape of it. It's really important, isn't it, Jack? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you consciously practice looking at plants closely, use your intuition, you cannot help but to begin to see plant species revealing their particular individuality and how much they may blend in or stand out in every, any given place. So foraging in the UK, timing is all on nature's non-stop carousel. It is a fantastic analogy. Foraging in the UK is a never ending cycle and one that certainly doesn't wait for us to be ready for it either. Nature offers a small window of opportunity to harvest certain plants and especially so with some of the individual plant parts. Over time, you will notice that individual species give or take a few local adaptations to conditions will always produce a distinctive shape, colour, look and feel to the eye, and especially within its particular preferred habitat. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about understanding plant communities. Plants you see hanging out together when foraging in the UK. As you begin foraging in new places or revisit previously visited areas, you will start to appreciate the distinct plant communities that are present in different habitats. Sometimes plants are exclusive to a particular habitat, sometimes not, and our experience can guide you. One example of a plant community are the heathland plants, which enjoy very acidic soils. Okay. Only a few grasses, various heathers, and ericaceous shrubs like bilberry, vaccinium myrtillusus can survive on these soils. Many other plant species have niche habitats that offer them opportunities to grow where others cannot. As saline tolerant plants, including sea kale, sea rocket, kakuli maritima, sea sandwar, honeki, peplodis and sea radish, raffinus raffinistrum, are typically only found by the coast and on estuaries. You will quickly become accustomed to the changes in plant communities as you move from habitat to habitat. Happy foraging. Oh, yes. <laughs> so tonight I'm going to take you through a beginner's foraging toolkit or a basic foraging toolkit. So gathering, what do we put our pickings into? I really like linen bags, as I said earlier, because plastic bags can sometimes make them go mouldy or yeah. stain water, which isn't really what we want. We want them to be able to be as fresh as possible, to decay as slowly as possible, so that we can get the best from the particular plants that we've foraged. So that's really easy. Fold them up and carry one with you all the time. As Jack knows, I've got one folded up in my beautiful little turquoise handbag all the time. So you it's really do. handy. <laughs> you can also get ones that you, you can wear on your belt. Can you now? Yeah. Oh, and I didn't know they, that. They're just, they're just a little thing about the size of a purse. But then you open them up and there's a big bag inside. Oh, wow, well, that'd be handy. And mm. it goes on your belt, Luke? Goes on your belt. Oh, how I've exciting. Got one. Next time I come and see you, I'll, I'll be mine and you can see it. Yeah, you're coming this week, aren't you? Yeah, but yeah, I'd love to see it, Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm really yeah. interesting. So, um, linen, because I don't particularly want my plants to sweat that much. Now, if I'm gathering medicine, then linen's really important. I don't want to be putting them into plastic bags. You can go foraging with a plastic bag 
like a supermarket brand bag if you really have nothing else. So we want the best when gathering our food. So my <laughs> top choice would be linen. And now Jack's told us about this, you know, expandable linen thing. Yeah, that's called forager's bag. Yeah, that's called forager's bag. It's, Perfect. It's leather, but it's a leather bag yeah. that folds out into a, a big, into a, got a, a linen area. Wonderful. Sounds great. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was berries. Having just said that plastics are taboo, clip top buckets or tubs are really useful for collecting berries. Not yeah, essential. Yeah. And I know we're trying to get away from plastic as much as possible, but it seems a bit daft to be reinventing the wheel if we've got something that is, you know, going to be good for the berries. Because also we don't want the juice to have leaked all over our other things. Yeah. So baskets get a good size one to fill up and get a load of elderflowers in season, possibly dry them. If you're wanting to dry your plants, if you are gathering something like elderflowers or other flowers that have pollen on, you'll probably need to remember they are full of pollen. So put linen, baking parchment or kitchen roll in the bottom so it will still capture them. Because most of the baskets, although they're beautifully woven, the seeds and the pollen's going to fall through, isn't it, basically? <coughs> Can I just say about elder that um, some people don't know this. It's actually poisonous until it's either cooked or fermented. Yeah, yeah you've got to cook it and then it's scrumptious. Um, mm, where did I get to? So um, by lining your basket with a uh, baking parchment or kitchen roll or something like that, then um, it allows the um, it allows the plants to dry out naturally and not too quickly as well. Um, so we want the best quality product for what we're going to use for medicine or for our salads or whatever else it is. Secateurs I've spoken about already. These are essential. You just gather and snip. Say you want to gather some willow bark. OK, you snip off the branches. Good quality secateurs will slice through pretty thick branches even. Yeah, yeah. Leaves, use your hands as first preference. Um, if you don't want to be picking things by hand, then, of course, use scissors. Even nettles, I don't use scissors. Either use a pair of gloves if I'm not filling up to it or I just use my hands. I don't really like wearing gloves because it removes me from the gathering process. It's more a sensory thing and I want to be able to feel the plant in my hands. One of the reasons I do that is sometimes, say with garlic mustard or wild garlic, you get the young stems coming through and they're very flexible and you can only really feel which bit is flexible before it starts getting woody further down with your bare hands, you won't be able to feel that as, shall I say, sensitively if you've got gloves on. But obviously, if you know, if you feel more comfortable with gloves on, then do that. As we are sensory primal beings, gloves may remove us one stage from that sensual experience. Roots, bearing in mind, you need a landowner's permission to dig up roots in Britain. An eyeglass probably sounds a little bit weird, but what a lot of people like to use is an eyeglass, like a jeweler's glass. Yeah. It's actually called a loop. I recommend using a 10 times magnification so you can really have a good look at everything. And although we're not talking about um, fungi, um, you know, one of the things that I do is to take the loop with me so I can really see the underside and the top to make sure that what I'm about to eat is going to be edible. So um, you, you bring the eyeglass, your eye, and you bring the plant towards you until you can see all the really fine detail. They're really important if you're going to be able to accurately identify plants. I recommend you get a copy of Francis Rose's Wildflower Key. I'll say that again. It was a bit of a mouthful, wasn't it? 
It was a bit, copy yeah. of Francis Rose's Wildflower Key. It's very self-explanatory. Take your time. It's really important to stop just trying to ID photos. I've seen people and it's perfectly laudable, but they've taken a shot of the plant and then Googled what it is. Mm. For you to really learn it, you perhaps need to be doing more than just taking photos, although that is, you know, that is a good way as well, so that you've got a permanent record of what it was that you, you know, were looking at to identify. You're better with a book, really, so that you can really remember and learn that. Of course, you can now get these plant ID apps on your phone. Um, but I, I, we must just say that they're not 100% reliable. No. So don't rely on, on a, a plant snap or, or something on your phone. Yeah. Uh, to know whether something's safe to eat. Yeah, yeah. And um, some time back, um, the lovely Woodland Trust used to do a swatch of all different trees. It was about that size. Mm. And on every single page, it was leaf shaped. And on every single page, it would tell you the actual size of the leaf, the actual size of the berries. So if they were, for instance, demonstrating um, horse chestnut, they would say this is a quarter of the size of its actual size. But then it would tell you the traditional uses for that particular tree. And they used to also do a swatch guide to herbs and wildflowers, which I've tried to get one for a friend last year, and it's no longer in print. Mm. Who's, who's, was, who wrote it? Uh, the Woodland Trust, it was. Oh, the Woodland Trust, OK, yeah. Yeah, so um, although I've still got mine, um, you know, I really wanted everybody else to be able to get them, but apparently they're not <laughs> going to reprint it, so. Uh, that's a shame. But get, get yourself some good books. So I've got some here, which I'll show you again at the end. OK. Um, Herbs and Healing Plants of Britain and Europe. It's a Collins Guide. OK, yeah. So it's got photographs in accurate photographs and it tells you all the medicinal values and all sorts of things then um how to identify edible mushrooms i know we're not really talking about mushrooms but again you know we need to identify what's good for us what isn't good for us this one i've had for a long long time and it's the country darling of edwardian lady and oh that's brilliant I that's love up. it, Jack. Brilliant. I love the illustrations. Yeah, that's a lovely, lovely book. And um, she does tell you a lot about, you know, each day when she goes out, she tells you about what flowers she saw, what she started drawing, what she knew they were good for. So although it is an old book, I <laughs> thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly recommend. Yeah, it's a lovely, um, lovely book. Country Darwin Edwardian Lady. And then, I, will put all, I will put all the links in the description. Oh, you're a little darling. Thank you so much. So, um, I, I bought a book today, look. What's that? What's that, Chrissy? What was it? I didn't see what it was. Something about forage, knowledge to forage. Knowledge to forage. Oh, Who's right. That by, who's that by, Chrissy? It's them. Um, they're on Facebook. I'm trying to think of the name. Um, oh. She's frozen. They're on, they're on Facebook and everything. It's a, it's a great book because it's very easy. To, it's like very easy to read, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, home. Oh, I'll have to tell you later. <coughs> uh, no, don't worry. I'll, I'll find it and I'll put the links below for it. Thanks, Christy. Thanks for sharing that, Christy. Home is, oh, I've got it. Home is where our heart is present. Knowledge to foraging. But they're on Facebook. Home is where our heart is. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Chrissy. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's very easy. It easy is, yeah. So, um, as I said earlier, the problem with photographs is they don't take you into the reality of the fine detail the fragrance and the whole caboodle. So that's often um, important to discern one species from another. 
but I, I understand why people use photographs for speed. So I have a good small one in a, so this one is really handy, Jack. So compared to my book, you can see how little it is. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. just the right size to stick in your waterproof pocket or, yeah, yeah. you know, to stick in, you know, stick in a pocket somewhere so that you've got it with you all the time and you could quickly reference. And I've got a cagoule that's got a big pocket at the front for maps, really. But also because that's so small, that was fit into called? that. It's called um, Herbs and Healing Plants of Britain and Europe um, by Dieter Pod Podlek. Dieter Podlek. Okay. Brilliant, yeah. It's a Collins Guide. So, uh, where did I get to? Once you find a flower, you've got all the species of plants, the best ways to know what family it's in. Once you know which family it's in, you can just go to that section in the books of that family and start identifying it. So it's a, a kind of shortcut to finding out exactly what plant it is if it's not one you're familiar with. Um, it's a little book on plant families, which is absolutely delightful that not many people know about, and it's by Faith Anstey. So getting yourself a knife too. I'm really fond of my Swiss Army knife. It's not the original Swiss Army knife. It's called a Leatherman or something like that. Okay. And that's a handy bit of kit to have with you because it's got all different blades. It's got a corkscrew. I don't know why you need a corkscrew foraging, but hey ho. <laughs> It's got a thing for getting things out of horses' hooves, <laughs> which equally, I don't know of what value that may be when you're foraging. But um, yeah, I quite often take my little, I think they're called Leatherman. So it's like a Swiss army knife in a, in a cover, basically. Yeah. Um, so we've already talked about knives. If you need to peel bark, need to peel it and skins while you're out foraging or in case you want to munch on something as soon as possible <laughs> so you've got your little knife and you can start eating straight away so that's awesome sounds, sounds good <laughs> so six edible wild plants that you can forage easily in the uk All right it's still fun to have a nibble and get to know what can be foraged for food while you're out in the british countryside these wild green leaves are also particular nutrient dense and very tasty. Wood sorrel or oxalis. The flowers are white and dainty, but its leaves are edible. They look a bit like a clover leaf and have a fresh citrus flavor. Delicate wood sorrel, white flowers are edible too. So in the past I've caught, let's say, a white fish like sea bass, or basophilids and putting wood sorrel in it gives it that really lemony taste as if you'd put I don't know uh, slices of lemon in whilst you were poaching it so um, give it a whirl sheep sorrel these are slightly larger leaves and they look like mini dock leaves quite often people have said I don't know what happened I got stung by nettles rubbed what I thought was dock leaves and it didn't do anything and I've said ah that's because it wasn't a dock leaf, it was sheep sorrel, because dock leaves, straight away, as soon as that juice comes out, it neutralises it, doesn't it? So they have well, two... The plantain is even better. Yes. Plantain is much better than dock leaf. The only trouble is there isn't a lot of plant... There isn't... No, let me say it another way. It, there isn't as much plantain as there is dock leaves, usually, is there? Uh, OK, yeah. Um... So that, yes, the sheep sorrel has two points at the base of the leaf near the stem. Dandelion leaf. Check it's a dandelion first. There is a similar looking yellow flower that is not edible. Dandelion leaves are edible. They don't have much flavour. They are good to add to a salad with other leaves. The leaves grow in sprigs and have a jagged long leaf. And as I said earlier, I've been digging up the roots and making um, making dandelion root tea because it's especially good 
for detoxification of the liver and lungs, which mm. is always going to be handy, isn't it, really? And I don't know about you, Jack, but at school, people used to, like the boys used to chase the girls with dandelions and go, I'm going to put this on you and you'll be wet in the bed. And actually, <laughs> there is truth in it. There is, perhaps uh. it wasn't the kind thing to do, but actually, a dandelion juice is a natural diuretic. So it, it is, would yeah. help you to urinate. It really would. So some well, of these... One of the country names is uh, Fissabed. Oh, well. Yeah. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. But I remember being chased by boys at school and going, no, I'm going to put this on you and you're going to pee the bed. <laughs> Strangely enough, I didn't pee the bed. And uh, my dad had taught me how to um, punch do an uppercut. So um, it didn't work very well for the boys that chased me, strangely <laughs> enough. Um, the leaves usually grow in sprigs and they have a jagged long leaf. Um, so recently um, I saw your post about your beautiful salad made with all lovely different leaves and petals and things. And one of the things I did throughout the summer was I ate nasturtium leaves and nasturtium flowers as well. And they are so tasty. The nasturtium tastes a bit um, sort of peppery like watercress or rocket really. But the flowers just taste delicious like, I don't know, like a mild honey. Absolutely gorgeous and you can eat them raw. Yeah, absolutely. You don't need to do anything with them, do you? I and they're them. good companion plants as well. Well, I had my canal boat. I used to grow them in pots. Yeah. And I used to grow dandelions in the pots as well. Yeah, and me. My brother-in-law, who does my garden, thinks I'm completely bonkers because I've got a pot where I planted dandelions and daisies. Yeah. <laughs> He's going, do you know they're weeds? I said, no, nope, they're wildflowers. Yeah. I want dandelions and I want daisies. Daisies are particularly good for helping with any kind of inflammation. You can make daisy tea. Yeah. They're not really edible as such, but they are very good for making tea with. And um, the humble dandelion, you can use every single part of the dandelion. Yeah. It all has medicinal qualities. So it isn't just um, Victor told me that he started having a delicacy, which is picking dandelion heads out of his garden and then lightly um, rolling them in flour and then he, um, then he fries them. And he reckons that tastes delish with that. And uh, I don't doubt that it does. I just haven't got around to trying it just yet. Yeah. So nettle leaf, one of my favourites to cook with. I've made in the past nettle soup and a veggie nettle lasagna. The trick is to you a, a pair of rubber gloves, unless you're really patient and you are going to spend time just grabbing them and pulling them out. You really need to be wearing rubber gloves. Um, your fingers, though, the tips of your fingers aren't that sensitive. Uh, they're, they're a lot stronger and, uh, and more leathery. You, you, if you have a, a sting of nettle on your arm, it'll sting. Yeah. But if you pick it up in your fingers, yeah. it doesn't If you grab it as well, the, the, the sort of yeah. hooks of the nettles can't hurt you, can they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, the once you've collected your nettle leaves, uh, boil or simmer the leaves like you would with spinach before using it as an ingredient. Nettle has a distinct mild flavour, perhaps a bit buttery or nutty and similar to spinach. So um, going back many years ago, I was in Sidari in Greece and the lady who we'd rented the villa from, um, she was teaching me about all the things she was making for Greek cuisine that all came from her garden. And one of the most delicious things I've ever tasted was she used um, nettle leaves and then chopped up red onions and fried it all up together. Oh, so delicious. Oh, so, gorgeous, so yeah. delicious. Yeah. Violet flowers, these dainty purple flowers do not grow in abundance. So we have to collect quite a few over, you know, a period of time, basically. It's a rarity to see a lot of violets together. Yeah. Um, 
They taste slightly sweet and when eaten fresh, they've got a mushroom flavour. So again, I've cooked them in the past, but um, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of them basically. So it might be that you collect it over a few days and look at different sites. Then bitter crest. Try the stalk and the small leaves. They are similar to bitter leaves like rocket and uh, watercress, and I quite like this one. Blackberry leaf. I've talked a little bit about blackberry leaves. They taste bitter, but they have a nice blackberry aftertaste. The, uh, it's the young stems and leaves that are edible. Once they're a bit older, they're not quite so edible. And as we've just been talking about, nasturtium petals and leaves are edible and they too have a rocket peppery taste. So what I thought we could do now is um, I'll just read you out some of the books that might be, be helpful. Although foraging for wild dainty flowers or leaves <coughs> are not going to provide a complete meal, I really love using them as a garnish or to add some subtle flavours it's quite cool to be able to pick something straight from nature. So some of the books that um, might be useful is Edible and Medicinal Wild Plants of Britain and Ireland, Botany in a Day, Pocket Guide to Wildflower Families, A Botanist Vocabulary, Francis, Rose, Francis Rose's Wild Flower Key and tarrips, wildflowers, and of course, what I've mentioned already, the herbs and healing plants by Dieter Podlet. So I wondered what other people's experiences are. I think while we're talking about books, we ought to include Richard Maybe's uh, Food for Free. Yes, do it. Yeah, um, because that's probably the, the book that got the whole thing started. Mm. Or at least the, the foraging revival after the war. Yeah, that's a very good word to use. Yeah, certainly. Certainly, darling. And there's a, um, a lovely illustrated version of it, too. Full, yeah. full colour illustrated version of it. Yeah, yeah. And as I said earlier, I really love, I've had this book so long, I don't even know when I had it, but the Country Diary of an Edwardian Lady by Edith Holden is just... Oh, it's a gorgeous book. Lovely, beautiful, lovely book. Beautiful paintings and illustrations. But I love the way she talks about, you know, that she's really noticing things and really present with every everything that she's noticing. So, yeah, I'd thoroughly recommend that. So what about you, Chrissy Chris? You are the foraging queen as well, aren't you? Mm. Um, I'm, not, I'm not that experienced yet, um, but I do eat daisies, the small daisies, as you know, on that plate. Yeah. Can you eat the big daisies or not? Yes, the you can. daisies. Oh, you can eat oxide daisies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, I, I, I got some from the bus stop and took them to you, Annie, didn't I? Them big you ones. did indeed, my darling. <laughs> and they keep, mow they keep mowing it. They keep mowing it. Down. How bloody mean. How yeah. mean! <laughs> uh, I would like to do... I've only got those few basics and I do want to learn a lot more. I, I think you do get a bit scared at times, but um, that, this book looks very easy to read, easy to understand. Yeah, that's what we need. We need to keep it simple, don't we? Yeah, and just, and just, be, just be very, very careful is all I can say. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Be absolutely sure that you identified what you're going to eat. Yeah, no. because not, a, not, lot of, lot of, a lot of very, very similar species, similar looking species that actually grow uh, close to each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just because you've got a, 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 a clump or something doesn't mean that all the plants in that clump are going to be the same species. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed, my darling. So be very, very careful. It's a wonderful thing to do. And uh, the more we're talking now about food shortages and food price rises, it's becoming more and more important, I think, that, uh, yeah. that we get as much food as we can from the wild. Absolutely. Not everybody has a garden, but everybody has access to the wild. Yeah. And I, I picked some, uh, what day was it? 
Friday, maybe. Friday, I was up the chase and we picked wild garlic. And yeah. and Jack, you know, and, and anybody who's listening, the taste and smell of it is far stronger than, you know, bulb garlic, isn't it? It's really, yeah, yeah, really yeah. strong. So again, I'd recommend that you use wild garlic when you can. And you can't miss it because of the fragrance. That's really right. There, there, there's, there, there are similar looking species, but there aren't any similar smelling species. No, exactly. Your nose, know. you know, so you know, he's telling you, isn't it? For sure. <laughs> so yeah, wild garlic, I'll thoroughly recommend. And um, I haven't used it for many years, but I used to really love the smell of the curry plant. Now tell me more about this. Somebody All was I remember is I was a special needs teacher in Blockswich and a local um, garden centre came and planted all these different herbs and, you know, really beautiful plants that the children could use and they could water as well. And um, I just remember that if anybody brushed past it, if the leaves were, I don't know, bruised in some way, then there would be that lovely curry smell. I haven't done any research, so I don't know if you can cook them and get a curry sauce out of it. I don't know. <laughs> but I just like the smell of it, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Isn't it hard work trying to introduce pe people to foraging? It's, it's very hard work, isn't it? The, mm. They'd rather have something with a load of... Well, I think yeah, well, some people just want things easy. Like that. Yeah. Some people just want these things easier. They don't want to make any effort. They don't want to learn anything. Whereas we're the opposite. We're going, oh, let's learn about <laughs> this. This is really exciting. <laughs> yeah. So, um, right. yeah, I, I think that increasingly the most unexpected people are coming forward and saying, oh, I do that. Oh, I make that. Oh, I do this. I do that. And I just think it's really lovely that... Um, more and more people are coming to that understanding that natural food is best for us. Yeah. And well, we know it's got no additives in, no pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, heavy metals or any of that monkey business. So yeah. um, it's a really beneficial way of um, making yourself, for instance, salads or, you know, the equivalent of spinach. Um, so, yeah, I'd thoroughly recommend having a look at <laughs> and trying some of those out, for sure. Now, I've got a list here of um, a couple of dozen plants that I think if everybody learnt these, just these couple of dozen plants... Go for it, Jack, yeah. They'd be away. So I'm just going to read through... Well, I'm going to read through it fairly quickly, but if you want to jump in on any of them and say something okay, about... Okay, darling, that. yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So we've already talked about plantain. And you've mentioned bramble leaves. Yeah. Uh, chicken in the woods mushrooms. Mm. Absolutely gorgeous. Chickweed. Oh, yeah. Common hogweed. Don't mistake it with, uh, with the big one. <laughs> um, We've been going on a completely different journey. <laughs> yeah. I will just say that uh, some people, are, uh, uh, um, their skin is uh, is sensitive. Yeah, to the sun. yeah. But, uh, yeah. So if your skin's sensitive to the sun, you don't want to get the uh, the sap on your on your skin. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not sure where we mentioned this, but common sorrel. Common yeah, we vet. did, but yeah, it's worth a second mention, darling. The yeah. more familiar we come with these botanical names uh, uh, of the plant, the easier it is for us to help each other, because we can say, you know, while sorrel does blah, 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 we, we need to be having these conversations, I really think so. Yeah, uh, cleavers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, or goose grass or sicky willies. <laughs> Cowslip. Oh, yeah. We've mentioned dandelion. We've mentioned all the daisy species are edible. Yeah. <laughs> evening primrose. Oh, yeah. Love uh, evening primrose. But 
the yellow ones, for preference. Yeah, absolutely. We've mentioned Jack by the Hedge. Yeah. Uh, giant Burdock for the roots. Oh, no, I hadn't mentioned that. Do you remember yeah. Dandelion and Burdock? Yeah. Pop. Greater yeah. Stitchwort. Say it again, Jack. Greater Stitchwort. Oh, well, I don't know what that one is. Okay. Ground Elder. Oh, yeah. Uh, most people have got it growing in their gardens. I wish they hadn't. But it's, oh, uh, absolutely. It goes berserk, doesn't it? And takes it's... over everything, basically. But it's a brilliant food. Absolutely. Hairy Bittercress. Ooh. Hawthorn leaves, young hawthorn leaves. I absolutely love them. Just pick yeah, them raw yeah. and eat them. Off. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Henbit. And it's good for the heart. Hawthorns, especially good for healing our heart and strengthening our uh, heart protector. It certainly is. Yeah, yeah, it's very good for you. Henbit. Oh, no, I haven't mentioned that. Lady Smock. Oh, yeah. Pretty as well. Um, Chrissy's mentioned purple dead nettle. Yeah. Sheep sorrel. Yeah. We've mentioned stinging nettles. Yes, indeed. Uh, St George's mushroom. Wow. Well. You've mentioned uh, you've mentioned ramsons, wild garlic. Yeah. Now rose hips, and also rose petals. Yeah. Rose petals, not treated, not sprayed. I have them. <laughs> it, absolutely. Yeah. Um, all thistles are edible. Indeed. But most of them need cooking. Yeah. You've Clover, mentioned... I eat quite frequently as well. Yeah. Um, the boys don't want to eat too much clover. It does. It is, it is a phytoestrogen. Mm -hmm. But that's only red uh, clover, and we usually only have the white. Yeah. Or yeah. occasionally pink, don't we, in the UK? We do, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, white dead nettle. Ooh. Wild gooseberries, if you can find them. Oh, I love gooseberries. I so love them. Would I really I... love that tarty taste of them as well. Yeah. Uh, woody a mushroom. Oh, nice. Yeah. A lot of people call it juicy a mushroom. Uh, wood sole. Yeah, I've mentioned wood sole, haven't I? No, I'll tell you what makes a really lovely tea, and that's yarrow. Oh, definitely. definitely and there's something I haven't got on this list, um, but oh. I need to add it in, and that's meadow sweet. That oh, makes, meadow sweet. So important, makes, isn't it? That makes a really, really lovely tea. Yeah, absolutely, darling. Absolutely. Fact, when, I, when I was on my canal boat, I used, I used to have uh, yarrow and... Um, and uh, meadow sweet tea quite regularly. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. And uh, all cherries are edible, although some yeah. don't taste too good. Yeah, some of them are really too sour, aren't they? So they're not, they're, they're edible, but they're not particularly tasty or delicious. But don't eat the stones. Indeedy. <laughs> right, that's my list of, I think if everybody just learnt those, those few, um, they'd be well, well away. Yeah, absolutely, darling. And you know what, what? What I'd like to say to people is, don't be scared of using things. You know, just obviously you need to. That's why we said right at the beginning, you need a good identifier so you know exactly what it is you're picking. But then yeah. just have lots of fun mm. making very colourful salads, and as you said, Jack teas. You know, uh, what Chrissy was showcasing the other day with all different kinds of colours and textures, flowers, petals. All of this is nature's abundance for us to use, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking if, if people haven't got a garden or they can't get out, 
Um, th you can grow this instead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know oh, yeah. what that is? It looks like a kind of cress. Go on, tell us what it is, Chrissy. Lentil microgreens. Is it? Yeah. Nice. They're, they're ready for picking now. Yeah. Fantastic, baby. They hardly need any space at all in order to do microgreens. Yes. And Chrissy's got this lovely thing she's shown me, um, which is a, a stacking microgreen. Yeah. Bar. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, it's uh, it's really good. The, yeah. the whole thing takes up less than a square foot. Yeah. And it stacks. That'd be ideal, wouldn't it, for any, like, I don't know, small spaces? What have you got? A dozen, two different, a dozen or so different greens growing? Um, I've, I've got about three or four. I'm trying to get more into it. But there's just yeah. no, there's no excuses, you see. There's no excuses to eat healthy food. Because that's not, you can eat that. As and when, you don't have to take it all out at once. You can eat it as you want it. It's live. Yeah, absolutely. Even if, even if you just got a little flat or something, you, uh, can, you, you can do that, yeah. Yeah, you can, you can even use a stainless steel. Sieve. Um, this is on the move. Hey. Hey. Uh, it's an obstacle course in my house. All you need is love. Da, 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 da. Oh, right. Chrissy's showing, me, Chrissy's showing us her tower. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. and then we've got, it. and the other thing is. And these little, I've got these um, little stainless steel mesh things that you. Oh yeah, yeah. I've got some growing in there. And nice that, one, Chris. That's mesh there. See. <laughs> so uh, no excuses for healthy food, is what I say. No, absolutely. Oh, there we go. Go on. I didn't even press nothing. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. I can definitely see you, Chrissy. Oh, right. <laughs> Lobstacle calls here. <laughs> right, as we, um, as we draw this uh, show to an end, I want to see if we can get a reaction out of Rupert. Okay. I mean, you've seen, you've seen, you've seen Honey. Let's see if we can get a reaction out of Rupert. Hello. Hey, <laughs> no, he's he's totally ignoring this, aren't you, mate? Hey, eh? he's totally ignoring this. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Well, thank you all very, very much. No, thank, thank you, Jack. Annie, for doing a brilliant, brilliant presentation tonight. Thank you, and for your input and Chris's as well. There is so then, much information. Anybody, um, anybody watching this, you know, on YouTube later, if you've got any comments about it or any ideas that you've got about what we could add to, you know, tonight's uh, show, then go for it. I think that's uh, what it's about, isn't it, to inspire each other? Yeah, and if you've got any questions, send them in. Yeah, one yeah. deep. And either Annie or I will answer them. Probably Annie, because she knows more about this than I do. Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> um, he's, just, he's awake. Rupert's awake. Hello. Hello. And he woke up <laughs> for the last little bit. Oh, oh what a sweetheart. Yeah. He's what gorgeous, isn't he? Oh. He's he's on. Here he is. Oh, he's on the move. Oh, he's on the move. now. <laughs> Rupert was on the move. Oh. <laughs> I'm so glad he moved then that you could really see what he's like then, couldn't you? He's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful cat. And thank you very much, Chrissy, for coming along and showing us your um, stacking farm thing. Yeah. I got, a, I got a bit of water on the computer. I've had to wipe it off when I was doing that with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so next week. I don't know what we're going to be talking about next week, but I'm sure we'll come up with something. We'll come up with something brilliant that we can talk about next week, no doubt. <laughs> I will put 
the link to all the books in the description. Thank you, Jack Cox. And the link to all the plants we've mentioned. Wonderful. Together, together with their Latin names. Just, Fantastic. Just to turn on Annie. <laughs> <laughs> I may live to regret having confessed <laughs> this lie. <laughs> there was definitely too much information there, Annie. Really. <laughs> Jack, I love to give you too much information constantly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much, everybody. Love you all. Thank you. Namaste. Bye. Namaste. Bye. 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 Bye.